Shout out or podcast coming your way, guys. We're doing another compound episode. This time we're going to talk about endurance steroids. This is episode 376. Steve Smee here and the Rickster. What's up, buddy? Hey, what's up, Steve? What's up, guys? How's everybody doing out there? All right, guys. So these endurance steroids, a lot of people, they are under the uh, misconception that, yeah, if you just run steroids, you're going to get faster. You're going to have more endurance. And that's not the case. Uh, but in this episode, we're going to talk about there are some steroids and some compounds. We're going to throw it that actually do help endurance that you can go to if you're an endurance athlete. So let's get to the first one. Number one steroid for endurance, guys, this blows everyone away, is Equipoise, EQ, Boldenone. And here's why EQ is really good for endurance. It's EQ does with most anabolic steroids do well, and that's raise your red blood cell count. Raise your red blood cell count, help oxygen get through your body more efficiently. So you're going to have a better wind, right? You're going to have more endurance, muscle endurance, cardio endurance. But unlike other steroids, equipoise does not aromatize as much as some steroids. Very little to none, no aromatization, because it aromatizes very slowly. So you're not going to get that big rush of aromatization like you would take in Dianabol, for example, which aromatizes into estrogen and gives you a lot of water retention right off the bat. Like within three, four days, you'll notice water retention from Debo for that reason. Equipoise doesn't do that. So you're not going to be running and having to carry jugs of water on your back. That's a good thing, right? So that covers that. You don't have to worry about that. Because if you try running with jugs of water on your back, it's not going to be a fun experience. The second reason why Equipoise is so good for endurance is pumps. It doesn't give you the crippling pumps that a bunch of other steroids give you. So if you're running and your calves, back of your lower legs, front of your lower legs, start giving you a pump, right? feels like a balloon in your leg about to explode. That's not going to help your endurance now, is it? So that's why Equipoise doesn't, you don't get those crippling pumps on Equipoise. Really, really good for endurance. So that's the cool thing about Equipoise, guys. So Equipoise, you get the good benefits of steroids without the negative side effects of steroids. And that's why Equipoise is actually a good option for endurance. You'll notice a good little endurance improvement with, with Equipoise. And I, I've experienced it myself. So that's my number one choice when it comes to endurance. And Rick and I, we agree on that, right, Rick? Yeah, you agree with Equipoise? Tell us a little bit about your experiences. Equipoise is great. It doesn't cause uh, some of the shin splint and muscle pumps problems that I've experienced with D-ball and Trambolone and some of these other steroids. And you can feel a difference in your in endurance levels with Equipoise. Like everything, if you overdo it, it'll start to have some counterproductive effects like every steroid if you are looking for nice good endurance then stay under a gram of juice once you start going over a thousand milligrams of combined steroids this is when a lot of the side effects that inhibit performance start to come in you know unless you're just lifting heavy you know any other activities you engage in you're going to lose some mobility. You're going to lose some endurance. It's just not going to be as good once you get up into the higher dosing. But low amounts of equipoise will help endurance. I mean, it's just, it's been tried and true. All right, guys. So, yeah, give give EQ a, a, a chance next time. Next time you want to run something for endurance, give EQ a chance. I would do EQ uh, probably at 300 milligrams a week. And just by itself, just try it by itself. You want to boost your endurance. You could run maybe a small TRT dose of testosterone, but don't run too much testosterone. That's what we're going to get into on the next, next one, testosterone. Now, again, with the testosterone, you got to be careful because testosterone does aromatize into estrogen. So if you're running testosterone and you're running too much of it versus an AI that you're running or you're running too much of it in general, it's going to, it's going to, cause water retention in the body. So if you're running, obviously it's causes water retention. It's also going to cause pumps. If you're not running at a moderate dose or higher, it's going to cause pumps. We don't want that either. So, but if you're on testosterone, this is where testosterone plays a role. And this is, this is my opinion. 
let's say you've got low testosterone levels, okay? You got low testosterone levels and you're trying to improve with running, right? If you were to go on a TRT dose of testosterone, let's say 100 milligrams a week, 125 milligrams a week at the most, you'll notice your endurance actually improves on testosterone. We've seen that anecdotal evidence. And, you know, we've seen that with people who have struggled with low testosterone for years and years. They got on test, uh, uh, TRT and then they're like, wow, I have more endurance now. I'm more, more, I can go longer in the gym and et cetera. So you get that reaction. But for everyone else, if you got normal testosterone levels as it is, and you run, let's say, 500 milligrams of testosterone a week, it's not going to help your endurance. It's going to hurt your endurance. So that's a no-no. So at the end of the day, if you run the testosterone properly at a low dose, it can boost your testosterone. It can boost your endurance because it's going to boost your testosterone levels to a normal level. And you'll feel normal, and you'll get you know you get those benefits of red blood cell counts and stuff. So. Again, it kind of transfers. I'd run a little, I'd run the EQ, maybe three, 350, 400 milligrams a week, and then run a little testosterone in there. And you'll get a nice endurance boost running them together. But if you overdose on the testosterone, if you run too much, once you start running closer to 200 milligrams, 300 milligrams, 400 milligrams testosterone, you're going to get that water retention. You're going to get that increase in heart rate, which is going to hurt your cardio. You're going to get those side effects, those androgenic side effects start kicking in. I've always said testosterone at a low dose is not considered an androgenic steroid if you run at a proper low dose. But if you run at moderate dose or higher, it does turn into an androgenic steroid. Anything that messes with your heart is going to mess with your endurance negatively. So that's why Equipoise we started out with is not an androgenic steroid. And I neglected to mention that. But that's important because it doesn't mess around with your heart. So you can keep your resting heart rate low and you can push yourself when you tap into your, you get your heart rate up during cardio, but it doesn't get too high where it actually slows you down. So you have a maximum heart rate that your body can hit. But if you run too much of the wrong steroids, you're going to tap that maximum heart rate very, very quickly. And that will prevent you from going faster. Just like a car engine, it's got the RPM spinning. If you run that RPM engine up into the red, you start messing up your engine. Your car can't go faster anymore. So it's all about, it's kind of like a torque. It's kind of like a Tesla. You have that strong torque with a Tesla. It's the same thing. You want the torque when it comes to endurance. We don't want to wear out our heart in the process. So testosterone, Good for endurance only at a proper dosage, do not overdose. And you can definitely test that out yourself if you want. So I'm going to bring in Rick. How does testosterone help you with endurance? Testosterone, like you said, is great as long as you don't use too much. Once you use too much, you begin to have some of the pumps and some of the other side effects that you get from the other steroids. Also, once you get up there in, in dosing four, five, six hundred milligrams of testosterone, you're going to get some aromatization, which is going to cause your blood pressure to rise is one of the side effects of, of having high estrogen is water retention and your blood pressure goes up. So I guess this can go almost for every steroid out there. The performance aspects of steroids are at the lower dosing. Again, that's if you're not a power lifter. If you're a power lifter, you can you can stack on a good bit of steroids for that one rep you're supposed to do and you're fine. Bodybuilders where you're not required to perform, just look a certain way. You go up pretty high, but if you're running, fighting, pedaling, doing anything like that, you're going to find that the performance aspects of any steroid, especially testosterone, are in the lower range, 200 to maybe three to 400 megs. 400 megs if you are starting off with really low testosterone to begin with. But if you have normal levels of testosterone, a couple hundred megs will do you. And then you might not need an anti-estrogen because once estrogen begins to get high, as I mentioned earlier, get some water retention, high blood pressure. So... That's it, man. Just a, a very low amount of testosterone will be enough 
to really improve your performance. And if you are a world-class athlete, if you, if you know one out there, just a little bit of testosterone will shave a second here, second there, increase recovery after a workout here, increase recovery after a workout there. And that can really tip the scales from you maybe not taking podium to being in the first place, being able to get more repetitions in, in your training, being able to come in day after day to your training pretty well recovered, being able to shave off seconds, you know, being able to recover faster, pedaling up a hill or shit, even if you're fighting, able to just hold on to that submission just a little bit longer, just a few seconds longer than you would have otherwise. But again, all of those performance aspects are in the lower, very lower, lower range of the dosing. Once you go up higher, it then it starts to become counterproductive for anybody else other than a power lifter or just a, a bodybuilder physique competitor slash. The next one we're going to talk about, guys, is HGH, human growth hormone. Lance Armstrong, he's famous for getting busted for, for uh, growth hormone. And he admitted in an interview that he did use growth hormone. He also admitted that he used EPO. Now, EPO, we don't, we're not going to talk about EPO on this podcast because it's a very dangerous compound to mess with. And, you know, this podcast is for the best stuff to use for endurance. And EPO, in my opinion, is not, is not a good one to use. It's obsolete these days. So we're yeah, EPO, EPO, EPOGEN is what it's called. It's, yeah, I mean, if you compare it to, we're going to talk about SARMs a little bit. If you compare it to something like GW, it really is obsolete at this point since GW has been on the yeah. scene. It's the much risk, safer, more effective. The risk versus reward makes absolutely no sense. It'd be, it'd be like equivalent to blood doping, basically taking, extracting blood out of your body and putting it back before the competition. It's not necessary to do that anymore, guys. These things that we're talking about are going to increase your red blood cell count. Testosterone EQ will increase your blood, red blood cell count. So there's no reason to blood dope or use EPO anymore. So that's why we're, we're going to, I wanted to mention it, but we're not going to talk about it in this podcast. I don't want you guys messing with it. But what, what Lance Armstrong does admit is human growth hormone. And human growth hormone is, is basically what our bodies produce, um, you know, when we're young, obviously going through, you know, our younger age, as we get older, really like in our teenage years, early twenties, as we get older, our, our, human, our human growth hormone starts dropping as we age. Now human growth hormone, the reason it's so good for endurance is recovery. That's the number one reason, because what happens is when you're an endurance athlete and a lot of you guys out there, you just weight train, you don't do much cardio or you do some cardio like on the elliptical or on a treadmill or something like that, but you don't do any hard endurance. Endurance training is extremely rough on the body. Okay. Much more so than weight training. And with in endurance, the key with endurance training is recovery because the quicker you can recover from your endurance train training that day, the quicker you can be back out there the next day. You don't want to have to rest the next day. You want to be out there again, getting it going. Okay. Again, it's like that RPMs in your car. You want to get that spin in as much as possible to train your body because that's how you're going to get your win. That's how you're going to increase your endurance. It's not like weight training, weight training. You're putting stress on your muscle. Okay. But with endurance, you're trying to basically build up that rhythm, that circle, that certain that circadian rhythm. Okay. With, with your heart. You want to get your heart stronger. You want to be able to push faster and longer. Okay. So a human growth hormone is essential to recovery. If you, again, we go back to the testosterone example. If you got low human growth hormone, which will happen once you get into your forties and fifties, your human growth hormone starts dropping. If you got low levels, it's going to get harder and harder you from the recover. So that hard training session you did where you ran 10 miles. Okay. You know, at 50 years old, running 10 miles, you're going to need a day to rest before you're back out there pushing again. But when you're 20, you can push that 10 miles the next day and go back and do interval training, do a 600 meter interval training session, eight on, eight off. Okay. But once you get to 40, 50 years old, it's not so simple. So here's that's where HGH comes into play. So if you got low HGH levels, running HGH is really going to be really helpful 
uh, for your endurance. And that's why guys do it who are endurance athletes, the cyclists and runners and stuff. That's why they mess with it. But you got to run it the correct way because if you run it incorrectly, it can give you a lot of water retention. So typically with HCH, when we first start running it, you might get some water retention that goes away. But it just boils down to you want to run good quality HGH, maybe two or three IUs at the most. I would not exceed three IUs. That then becomes counterproductive. But it's again, it gets to the point where if you can get the eight HGH levels in your body where you're a 20 year old at 50 or at 40, that's going to help you recover quicker, repair quicker, and you'll be out there again, ready, ready to rock and roll. So, Rick, I'll bring you on HGH. Uh, tell us a little bit about HGH. So HGH, uh, a big difference between that and some of the other drugs we have discussed and are going to discuss next is that HGH is not really a, a game day drug. You know, uh, having the HGH in your body the day of competition, it's not going to be as conducive to high performance as having the higher testosterone or the EQ in your body the day of competition or having definitely taking your GW your cartering, the day of competition. HEH really shines as a practice drug, as a drug that you take, like Steve said, you take for training. You, you train to your fullest, your body recovers, and you come back the next day to do it again. HEH helps promote the repair and growth and strengthening of your tendons, your joints, your muscles. It really... If you're training hard, giving it your all, that that additional human growth hormone in your system will help to just make sure your body is adapting to the training. Your body is it's enhancing with the training. And really, that's where HEH really shines. You could potentially use the human growth hormone all the way up to the week of competition and then just cut it out a few days before, not use it the day off. And you still have most of the benefits that you gained using the growth hormone of those months. Your tendons, your joints, muscles will still be just strong and, and thick and just as prime for, for performance, for specific performances they were when you were taking the HEH. And that's, that's something really different as opposed to like GW or even the androgens. I guess you could use testosterone in that in that way for some for some uh, sports and EQ. If you're a tested athlete, EQ you don't want to take because EQ is going to be detectable for up to a year as a tested athlete. It does help performance as long as you don't get tested. But if you get tested, at least a good year, sometimes a year and a half for something like nandrolone or EQ because of that long ester, be detectable. But yeah, I mean. Um, so that's, that's an important thing to note with, with GH is really a drug to, to be taking during those hard months and weeks of training coming up to the competition. And the day of competition, it might not do much on, on that particular day. Yeah, and before, you know, the and people out there get confused, uh, they're like, oh, you know, it's not an anabolic steroid. It's not. Human growth hormone is a peptide hormone. It's not an anabolic steroid, but it's very important to talk about it. You know, if we're going to talk about endurance, very, very important to talk about it. Because if you do have low HGH levels, you've got low testosterone levels, guess what? You're never going to succeed at endurance sports. you got to get those levels up. So if you're an older guy in your 40s and 50s, you got low levels of HGH, low levels of testosterone, you may want to look into getting those levels, you know, back to normal or, you know, back to where they were when you were 20 or 25. And I've said this on the podcast before, but for any new guys listening for the first time, maybe go over this real quickly again. Uh, human growth hormone is a completely different structure than testosterone or, or Anavar or, or Dianabol, or whatever. Those are steroids. They're ring structures. They're not very large, not very complex. Human growth hormone, on the other hand, is a very large, very complex, folded up protein structure. I make the comparison that in size and complexity, testosterone would be a golf ball. Human growth hormone would be a car in size and complexity, a lot larger, a lot heavier. 
And also growth hormone is specific to the animal that is specific to meaning while you can take that same testosterone and inject it into a horse or a dog, and it'll have the same effect, comparable effects as it has on a human. You can't take that human growth hormone and inject it in those animals and expect any sort of result, just like you couldn't take human growth hormone off of a, off of a horse or, or dog and use it on yourself. It just won't have the same effects. Those uh, it's a very complex folded up protein structure that's very specific to the animals that produces it. So yeah, human growth hormone and steroids, completely different realms in how they work and how the metabolites um, uh, downstream from the original uh, hormones work. We call them hormones, right? Because they basically are carrying a message, but they're completely different in size, complexity, and how the body processes them, how the body utilizes them. Just want to to toss that out there. I've said on the podcast several times, but we get new listeners all the time. It's just a good idea to make that distinction. All right, guys. So the next one we're going to talk about is SARMs. And again, SARMs are anabolic steroids. In fact, some of these compounds that we're talking about within SARMs aren't even SARMs. So the first one we have to talk about, GW501516, cartering. Not a SARM, it's a PPAR agonist, but um, carberine is a weapon. And it really is a shame that some people out there are uh, so negative about it. Uh, because if you're, miss, you're missing out, you're missing out not using carberine for uh, endurance. It's just an amazing compound for that. And the way carberine works, being an agonist of PPAR, it actually allows your body it's not like it doesn't it's the opposite of using a stimulant so again we go back to what i was talking about revving up your car engine but when you run the carterine it doesn't rev up your car engine like caffeine and caffeine st and stimulants do so you take a pre-workout with stimulants revs up your engine your engine's spinning really 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 fast going up into the red range right wearing out wearing out wearing out but with carterine actually allows you to push harder longer without going into that red zone with your rpms so you can you can run 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 more on it and it won't push your heart rate up in the process so it really is an amazing compound to use and even as a weight train weightlifting when you're pushing out that extra rep your heart rate's sky high and getting jacked up when you're on carding, you push out an extra rep because your heart rate will be a, be a bit down, maybe 10, 15% lower in the same effort. So really with carding within a few days using this stuff, if you usually run like an eight minute mile within a few days, maybe four or five days, if you take this every day, then you, you run that same mile with the same amount of intensity, same amount of intensity you'll shave like 20, 30 seconds off your mile time. That's how amazing this stuff is. So we talked about stuff being obsolete earlier in the show. Cartering is a big reason why these other things are obsolete. So another one, SR9009, it's a rib ERBA. It's not a SARM, but uh, SR9009, which is stenobolic, same concept as cartering, same concept. But with SR it has a much shorter half-life. So the way I recommend you take SR is before any type of training. So the good thing about SR is you get a peak, a quicker peak, and then it comes back down and it's out of your system. So the benefit of that is you can take it right before your run or your bicycle trip or your swim, and it's going to be in your system within 15, 30 minutes. It's going to be peaking in your system. You can take advantage of it. Carterine, it's got a longer, it's got a much less of a peak. It kind of just gradually increases in the body after you take it, and then it comes back down. So it's a drug, guys. It's not a hormone. It's a drug. And uh, so in this situation, you'd want to run, let's say, 20 milligrams a day of the carterine. And then with SR, you want to take 5, 10 milligrams whenever you need it before your run. If it's your competition day and you're running a 5K and you want to do your best, take 
go ahead and take 10, 20 milligrams of SR. You can take the carterine every day leading up to your race and then take the SR right before your race and you'll get, you'll get some nice effects. It is up to uh, debate because some people believe if you take them both together, they kind of compete for the same receptors or, or whatnot. So I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure if that's true. I'm still waiting for more anecdotal evidence proving or disproving that. But I would say that you can get away with just running one of them or you can get away from winning both and, and give it a shot and see what can happen. But I, you know, I can tell you for sure that, you know, it's, they work, they work amazingly well for endurance. So they allow you to go push more with less intensity. So you're going to basically not have to do as push yourself as much and you end up getting the same time, whether it's a swim, a bicycle, or, or a, a run. And that's, that's what makes these amazing. So it's, it's really one that you really need to add to your uh, arsenal for sure. And I think if, back in the 2008 Olympics, Rick, pretty much every Olympian was using them because they weren't testing for cartering back then. They didn't have, they didn't have a, a, a way to test for it until after the Olympics. It wasn't banned yet. But then in 2008, everybody was using it. So, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those where you better be using it if you want to uh, stay up with people. What do you have to say? I agree. GW is probably the best performance enhancing drug for, for cardio endurance that we know of today. I think you covered pretty well the SOMS aspect of it, how to use it, what it does. I'll give a little bit of clarification. I like to bring context into some of these things we're talking about, why some of them are SARMs and some of them are not. So SARMs stands for selective androgen receptor modulator. So these are drugs that selectively attach to some androgen receptors and cause an action, the receptor. Now, when we say some of these are not SARMs, like GW, GW doesn't attach to the androgen receptor. It doesn't have any action there. So even though we lump them in as SOMs in that category and they're sold that way, and that's the way you search them out to find the information when you Google it, technically doesn't have any action on the androgen receptor. So it is not a SARM. Now, what is the difference between SARMs, the ones that do have an action in the androgen receptor, and your regular steroids? It's pretty simple. If you, if you look at a, a, a graph of the chemical structure of a steroid, they all look about the same. Unless you know what you're looking for, they all look pretty identical. SARMs, on the other hand, don't look anything like the steroid. Most of the SARMs out there, your, your Osterin, your LGDs, your S4, when you look at it on paper, it looks nothing like a steroid. Now, these SARMs have a part of their structure that will attach to the androgen receptor. Just that one side is going to be suitable to attach to an androgen receptor. But the rest of the structure, it's nothing like a steroid. So your aromatase enzymes, your reductase enzymes, your enzymes that would normally do and turn your steroids into different hormones that are cause side effects, like, like racing estrogen, racing DHT, causing the appearance of DHT-like hormones that are compete against natural DHT, all of these things, the SOMs are just not susceptible to. The SOMs are just not a good substrate for these other enzymes because they don't have a suitable structure for the enzymes to attach to them. So this is why you get nowadays some people preferring SARMs because although they have some action, not as strong as, as most steroids, but some action on the androgen receptor that's beneficial, outside of the androgen receptor, they're not being affected by enzymatic reactions, reactions from these enzymes that'll make them change into different metabolites that are just not desirable to, to our, to our ends, to our goals. So just a little clear up that distinction since you already covered uh, the dosing and the use of it. Just wanted to clear that up for guys in case you 
having listened to every other podcast where we discuss this subject. All right, guys, so that sums it up for endurance compounds. I uh, hope you guys uh, learned a lot from this. Definitely let us know. Any other questions, come on the forums, evolution.org. Hit me up, Steve, SMI. All right. How can I hit you up, Rick? Hit me up. Uh, check out my social, www.rickyvrock.com. That's R-I-C-K-Y. V as in victory, R-O-C-K.com. Find me on social. Send me a message. If you have any questions, hit me up. rickyvrock at gmail.com. Hit me up with any questions you have. I'm also very active on the forums, evolutionary.org, elitefitness.com, anabolex.com. Just come check me out. Drop me a PM. I'm always around to help you guys out. Anything any of you guys need. Um, it doesn't have to just be questions about my own products that I produce. You can just ask any questions you have, and I'll make sure I take good care of you guys. With all these drugs and all these compounds that you take, I have a, a great liver, kidney, heart, pretty much every organ support product. N2Guard.com. Go to N as in Nancy, the number two guard, like guard, like guardian, dot com. N2Guard.com. Check it out. Great product. It's, uh, you know, selling my, my legal over-the-counter supplements is what allows me to come back day after day and do this podcast for you guys. So please do come out and support. I don't have any other, uh, besides that and some consultation clients, that's how I pay the bills and I'm able to keep researching and keep coming back day after day to do this podcast for you guys. So uh, please come out and support. I really appreciate, I really appreciate each and every one of you guys that spends a little bit of your hard earned money in my store need to build muscle.com. That's my store. Come check it out. If you, if you want to support me, support the show that you'd like to buy a bottle of a product here or there, you're out of the country. You have some questions. Just hit me up. Ricky V rock at gmail.com. Go to Ricky V rock.com. Find me, ask me your questions. I help you find the product that is best suitable for your program. I help you put together your program just come and support, man. Um, uh, I appreciate every single message, message I get from you guys. All right, guys. Excellent. Talk to you guys next week. Send in your Q&As and we will read them on the air. Have a good one. Have a good one, Steve. Have a good one, guys. Guys, this is the required legal disclaimer. We are only sharing our experience from years of steroid use. We are not doctors, and none of what we say should be regarded as medical advice. Always check with your doctor before taking any drugs or starting any training program. Training.